My topic uh, today is about the practicalities of delivery of drug into the CSF spaces within the brain and the central nervous system in children for treating tumours. The influences for um, suitability for treatment are really down to the distribution of the disease within the child and the type of the tumour that they have and the extent to which they've had other treatment options tried first because this sort of therapy is not usually the first line therapy, it's usually something that's tried when other treatments have failed and something that's tried perhaps for symptom relief when there's a recognition that the, the tumour isn't going to be cured but the patient's having a lot of symptoms due to disease within the CSF spaces. It's been used in our unit in a wide range of different tumour types, although the commonest ones are tumours which metastasise or spread widely within the CSF spaces, so medulloblastoma and ependymoma have been the majority of cases that we've treated to this point. The commonest means of achieving uh, regular access for a clinician to the CSF spaces is to implant a small plastic reservoir into the ventricle of the brain, which is where the CSF is produced and they, those are usually called Omaya reservoirs, named after Omaya, a Pakistani-American neurosurgeon, although other designs of reservoir are available. And that allows an injection through the skin into the reservoir, which is usually placed behind the right ear, and uh, the injection then goes from that point from the reservoir into the ventricle, and the drug is carried around and circulates within the CSF spaces. The concerns as a surgeon um, putting a plastic device that's going to be indwelling in the child perhaps for months or years are that uh, you're implanting a foreign body into a child who may become immunocompromised as part of the treatment they're receiving with the intrathecal drug or drugs they're receiving otherwise for the treatment and that reservoir is going to stay in and be regularly accessed by other health professionals and every time something is injected into the reservoir there's a concern that bacteria from skin um, even with aseptic precautions being used, skin bacteria may get in, get into the plastic, circulate around within the nervous system. And just as the drug can be disseminated around very effectively by the CSF circulation, unfortunately any infection that gets in can also be disseminated around very effectively. So infection is one of the principal concerns that uh, surgeons have about implanting devices like this into patients like this. Our experience has been very positive in that while we have had, as anticipated, one or two infections, the numbers have not been very high and I think that's a tribute to the, the precautions and the, the, the practice of the oncologists who are carrying out the regular injections into the reservoirs and patients haven't had a lot of other symptoms or problems. Theoretically they could have problems with epilepsy, with seizures as a result of the reservoirs being there. We implant reservoirs into the spine sometimes as well to allow fluid in the spinal uh, compartments to be accessed and we had anticipated that might cause discomfort in the back or problems with pain down the legs and things like that. And these haven't been treatment limiting side effects. So our experience has been that the, these devices are well tolerated by the children who have them implanted and, uh, and can be used very effectively for prolonged periods. The regulatory side largely relates to the delivery of the drug on a day-to-day -day basis by the oncology teams who do that and a lot of it's about meticulous checking and, and safety, making sure the right patient is getting the right drug into the right port. Some of these patients will have a venous access port as well as a CSF access port and it would be an absolute disaster if the wrong drug was injected. Uh, something that should have gone into the venous access port was, was inadvertently instilled into the CSF access port. So meticulous checking, being incredibly careful, checking over and over again that you've got the right patient, the right drug and the right site of access. These devices are designed that they can be left in and we have had instances where we've left them in just sitting silently and the child has got on with things for a while and then we've been asked to, to just check that the device is still usable for a further course of delivery of intrathecal therapy and that's usually been possible. If there is any concern that the device might have blocked off, you can give a small dose of uh, contrast medium into the device and check with a scan that it's circulating around nicely and that the device is still functionally useful. The aim with many of them is for them to be able to be out and about as much as possible and come to the hospital for a few minutes each day on the days that they're receiving therapy and it's really as simple as a small needle being inserted into the device, a little bit of fluid being withdrawn, the drug being injected and the child can be up and about and on the go and go away from the hospital again within a few minutes afterwards. The aim is to interfere with life as little as possible while this treatment's being delivered. 
I think it's still quite specialist at the moment and there is a perception perhaps that it's complicated and what I hope to show in my presentation today is that the equipment that we use is something that would be familiar to most neurosurgeons in most departments and certainly from a practical point of view from the neurosurgical side of implanting devices for intrathecal therapy it, it is straightforward and it could be more commonly used. At the moment we've used it in perhaps five or six patients a year over the last six or seven years. I can comment on those in that I think all of the approaches need to work together. I don't think treating children's brain tumours is a simple question and I think one of the problems is that different parts of the tumour, different aspects of the tumour, the original tumour site, metastatic spread of the tumour, can sometimes best be addressed using different techniques. And I think the answer to getting better results in children's brain tumours is to think creatively about using all of these technologies together in, in selected cases. I think this is a straightforward technique. Intrathecal therapy is a relatively straightforward technique which can help a lot of patients.